Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Joe Lynch, and today's topic is everything to everyone with my buddy, J.D. Redmond. How's it going there, J.D.? Man, everything is going really well. It's a little bit rainy today, but I think our conversation will bring a little sunshine. (laughs) I know it will. I know it will. So before we get started, J.D., please introduce yourself and your company. So hello, everyone. If you have never heard of me, my name is J.D. Redmond. I am the owner and founder of AXA EXPD. We're a marketing firm that specifically serves the logistics industry as well as the athletic sports industry. And we focus specifically, and this is our specialty, we focus on this because this is our expertise. This is a joke between Joe and I. You all, if you're watching, you're seeing our expression. If you're listening, we're joking. But expertise are tactical advertising. So if you're looking for customer acquisition, that's where you call us. And we find a way to penetrate that customer so that you can turn them that prospects, you can turn them into a customer as well as managing social media and developing our complex campaigns. Excellent, excellent. I reached out to JD because I was connected with him on LinkedIn and I would occasionally see speaking on Freight Waves, speaking on the other podcasts, others. And he's one of those interesting follows on LinkedIn. And so I thought I was thinking of this topic, everything to everyone. And it this has come up before. And then I thought when I was kind of I had written it down on my planner and then I was just scrolling through LinkedIn. I was like, oh, this is the guy to talk to about this because he, I know he's got this. I'd seen things he'd written and I thought this is a, a, a good fit. But before we get into the topic, J.D., Tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? And give us some career highlights before you started AXA. And are you going to tell us what JD stands for? I probably won't, but <laughs> I, I'm going to keep it at JD. So guys, I'm, I'm honestly just a country boy. And I typically tell people when they ask me this, it's a one-line thing. I'm a country boy trying to make it in the city. <laughs> I grew up in Louisiana in a parish called Magatish Parish. Indian tribe is named after it. And so grew up there in the the 90s, uh, loved it, country boy riding horses, cowboy boots, whatever you imagine. Yes, we rode alligators to school (laughs) because people in Louisiana do. And I know you guys probably think that. And yes, there's only one city in Louisiana. It's New Orleans. (laughs) There's Baton Rouge, too. (laughs) Baton Rouge. You know, typically you're like, oh, Louisiana. Are you from New Orleans? It's like, oh, gosh. (laughs) One city. I grew up there, graduated Nagdish, Nagdish Central High School. Currently, right now, I'm in the process of getting another master's degree from WGU, Western Governors University, bachelor's degree as well. So I have that. And then as far as career highlights, I think my biggest career highlights all started at my first real job, which was at Apple in Los Angeles, California. And I was able to Work my way up from a part-time specialist to becoming an expert, which means you kind of know a lot about Apple products. And we were consistently in the top 5% of salespeople in Apple. So at any given time, I could have sold anywhere between 2 to $5 million worth of Apple product a month. And that was a career high because it taught me that when you have brand loyalty, you can do anything. So my store, Joe, the Americana brand, is right across the street from the first Apple store in Glendale, California. So the first Apple store is inside a mall. The Americana brand is literally across the street and it's an outdoor mall. And we would be doing $300,000, $400,000 outside. They would be doing $300,000, $400,000 inside the mall right across the street. And it showed me brand loyalty and targeting the appropriate customer base. You can produce new heights. So they're doing millions of dollars a day In the same city. Right. J.D., before we go any further, I want to get the rest of your story, but this comes up on our podcast. There was nothing more unsexy, more uninteresting than a phone when I was a kid. They weren't mobile. If you were lucky, you had a long cord and call waiting. (laughs) Right. And what Apple did is they made not only laptops, but phones sexy. They made them interesting. They made them cool. If you were to tell me as a kid that the phone would be a cool thing to have, a status symbol, I would have laughed. I'm like, everyone has one. They're on the wall. You got a long cord. What's the big deal? Now you get people 
willing to sleep in New York City or Chicago, Detroit, in the street, in the winter, to get the first iPhone. I have no idea. Like when you say, hey, check this out. I got the new iPhone. I slept in the street for it. Do your friends think you're crazy? I mean, they got to. It doesn't think, make any sense to me. I think in the beginning it was you were crazy. You notice I held up an Android when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the beginning it was crazy. And then all of a sudden I was a part of Apple when it became a business. And so that's when you first started seeing people paying the average Joe 50 bucks an hour to sit in line for them or 15 bucks an hour, depending on what the price may be right then. And now you have resellers coming about. But in that one area in Glendale is where it taught me, like, you can truly do damage when you have brand loyalty and you target the right audience. My second highlight would be fast forwarding over to Hertz, where I worked my way up and got into regional management and started as a manager trainee. And that was another, again, work your way up. But I was able to find something there, Joe. I found that a sales pitch did not require 15 to 30 minute demos in order for me to get a full sale. So if you remember, and this is prior to me working at Hertz, but Hertz used to pride themselves in getting a customer in and out in under 30 seconds. And it was like, come in, come out. That was back when OJ was the main guy for them. He was jumping through the airport, heard the notebooks and suitcases. So go OJ, go. Go OJ, go. <laughs> so when we had this epiphany then, we were still doing it. Would you like to get the complete protection package was the question. And you had some people that are business travelers. Yes, whatever. And that was a, a $79 a day thing that we bonused off of. And then when they said, no, we were like, okay, well, great. You don't have to get that, but you can get a package set. And why is this a career highlight? I had to face 96% no's every day because that was the statistic. 96% of the time, everyone's going to say no to the complete protection package. And I still had to stay smiling and continue <laughs> to offer another package until they bought something because yeah. you weren't going to leave without buying something. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think when you look at like all the CEOs in America, top companies, how many started their career working at McDonald's. I think if you were to look right now, how many people went through Hertz rental car. And it's funny because I always think that when I get a Hertz rental car or any of the rental cars companies, they all have kind of a lot of young people there. And you know, you're not retiring from there, <laughs> but they move them through. And it's funny because you learn customer service, you learn how to deal with the public and Man, you're right. It does move. You, you never find yourself. If you find yourself ever waiting at a, a rental counter, you're like, I'm never going there again. I waited four minutes. <laughs> Typically, when I find myself waiting, because I was a part of that era where we were building most of the systems that all of the rental cars use, I'm typically able to kind of look and I will first try to be as polite as possible. After about 30 minutes, the old area manager comes back and I'm like, hi, my name is JD. I used to actually work on this system. You're telling me you don't have any cars, but I'm sitting in that little box there. You go down to the right, to the left. Yeah, click that. You actually have 27 cars sitting outside, 47 on the way. Can I take that car right there? Please? And like, I won't tell anyone else in line, but for me, for me, because I always run with Hertz. And so at first it used to be, okay. Now you want to be this person. Let me make a phone call to, and it used to be Joe McPherson. And I'm like, we call Joe McPherson, the top guy. They're like, Joe, I need you to make something shake. I'll have a business meeting. And I <laughs> right <now. laughs> That's the advantage of working at Hurts. You forevermore, you call on the bat phone after that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But that was so, my highlights. And then the last I would say would be TTN Fleet Solutions. Um, that's where I cut my teeth and got into executive leadership. So I went from an area manager to a corporate liaison to a director of sales and marketing, eventually a VP of marketing, um, where we took that company from 70 million to about 155 million in two years. Tell me about that. They're a logistics company, right? Tell us about them. So TTN Fleet Solutions is an emergency roadside intermediary. So when I am at a Schneider or a JB Hunt and a truck driver breaks down, instead of them calling the company directly, They may call a number that is forwarded directly to TTN and we facilitate sending out a tow truck, emergency repair vehicle, diagnostic, figuring out what's wrong with the truck. So if the truck is going into full on regen and it's shutting down on them on the side of the road, we send out a tow truck, tow it to the nearest Lowe's or to the nearest shop, figure out if we can get a DPF cleaned on it. If we can't get the DPF cleaned, let's replace the DPF, get the truck on its way. And if that's going to take too long, 
then we'll send out combo toes and we'll combo toe you and that to loves and then we'll drop that power unit get another power unit out there and continue that load on so that we can make sure we can get you the legs. Speaking of niches, that's a pretty nice one. And that's where I, how I got connected to you. And I saw you talking about that on podcasts and articles and all that other stuff. And that's how we got connected, which brings us to the topic today. So, so again, I would, I've used this term, everything to everyone. And when I've said it to JD, he goes, oh, yeah, I know you're, I know right where you're going. <laughs> and one of the things that when you talk about logistics sales or logistics marketing, one of the things, and I don't see it as much as I used to, but I, someone will call me up and say, we're trying to grow our sales. I want to help us with our digital market. I don't do so much of that anymore, but I did do a lot of that, a lot of sales training. And they, when I say, well, what do you specialize in? And they would say, we're everything to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> or they, they would say something a little longer than that, but it'd be basically the same thing. We have trucks and they would say, we do dry van, we have reefers, we have this, we have that. And then what ends up happening, everyone putting their sales hat on says, I got partners who do everything I don't do. And so they never say they can't do anything. And the challenge with that is when you're everything to everyone, you're really no one to everyone. You're a nobody to everyone because you haven't committed to a niche. You haven't picked anything. And so I think it's really important, more important now than ever before, if you're in the, any business, to pick a niche and or niche. And I shared this with uh, JD when we're prepping. I did a podcast a year or so ago with Kevin Hill from Freight Waves. It was the niches have riches. And it was about the same thing. Logistics market segmentation. Sounds boring. But pick pick, pick a specialty. Be good at something better than everybody at something. Don't be a jack of all trades and a master of none. So enough of my blather. I want to get your two cents on this, JD. No, I don't think it was a blather, man. I think it was something that needs to be stated. And I think along the lines of ensuring that we talk to the audience that you have, which you have a very intellectual audience, we have to bring in a word that Joe and I have been discussing for a little bit, which is maturation. So you have stages where companies go through where if it's a, and I was discussing with Joe, if it's a startup and they don't have access to a Joe or access to what is called a SME, a subject matter expert, then typically they're going to try to be everything to everyone because they believe that that gives them the greatest possibility of yielding earnings. But when they have a Joe, that Joe is going to say, I need you to specialize and figure out what you want to be. Not when you grow up, but what do you want to be now? So that we can make sure we're talking to the appropriate target audience. Now, in the niche of marketing, it's quite difficult when a client comes to me and I recognize they are everything to everyone. And so we try to discuss with them, well, what segmentation do we want to go after right now? What's your bread and butter? And when you say that, they're like, no, we want to get everyone. No, 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 no. What's your bread and butter? If this, if this skew, if this item, if this service, if this offering doesn't come through Every month, it's going to eat away your greatest profit margin. What is that? Oh, it's X. Talk about that. Okay. We're going to focus on that and we're going to excel and get that one segment to its highest heights. And when we feel like we've reached it, then we're going to go focus on another thing to become an expert on. Market 55 products. Right. And you know, with pre-internet, which there was a time, guys, I, I remember vaguely, you could call somebody on the phone and say, hi, uh, I work with XYZ Logistics Company, and we want to help you move your freight. And they'd say, what do you specialize in? And I would uh, go, oh, let's see, what do you do? You do industrial. We specialize in industrial. We move a lot of industrial stuff. And, And that worked. And so I could call everybody. They can't look me up. They don't look at my LinkedIn profile. There's no internet. They don't look at my website. There's no internet. So they just go, I talked to this guy today, Joe Lynch, and he said they specialize in industrial. Meanwhile, Joe's saying to the food company, we specialize in food. He's saying to the retailers, we work lots of retailers. You could get away with it. But now I go and I say, I have a new logistics company or I'm I'm an existing logistics company. And I go to JD and I say, help me with my website. And he says, what do you specialize in? It will come out very quickly. What do you specialize in? And I'll say, hey, JD, what I do is I've dry vans and I have reefers and we have a brokerage and we have a warehouse. I would like to rank page one Google for all those things. So get going. <laughs> and JD says, it can't happen that way. That's not the way this world works. Rather than be inward focused and say what I have, I have trucks, I have warehouse, I have a nice brokerage, I have all this great technology. 
That's not what your customer wants to hear is how great you are. They want to hear that you specialize in their biggest problems. So if I say, I have these five problems, I want to go to your website and see that you have solutions for those five problems. And it's either there or it's not. It's kind of hard, kind of hard to fake it now. But when you said that, what was making me nervous as you were discussing the different offerings of, you know, I can be the food guy, I can be the industrial guy. What's scary about that is when you know supply chain, which your audience does, let's just take you are the food guy. Okay, are you dry or wet? Okay, if you're dry or wet, are you temp controlled? Okay, do you know what a reefer is? Okay, you don't know what a reefer is. Okay, do you know how to handle a reefer? Do you know how to drive it? Do you know what the specs are? Like, this is when we start to figure out, well, you can even say, okay, and I've seen some people think that food carriers include poultry or livestock, and it doesn't. So then you have all these different segmentations in just the food carrier business, and someone says, oh, we do food. Yeah, we're we're carrier. We do all foods. That's kind of scary. Because I know you don't have that mix if you are claiming to be a carrier. Now, if you're claiming to be a broker, I may believe you that you have access to the carriers for that mix. But you as a carrier cannot fathomably be able to do everything in food. Right. It's not- right. That's the crazy thing about it is when you say you can do everything, it really it does limit you. And so what? So when we're trying to – when I say I want to rank for, let's just say we'll use food – the name of the game is to say specialize. And by the way, I've done a number of websites. I've worked with enough companies on sales strategy that I can say this. And I think JD can say the same thing. When you talk to companies, usually they'll say, well, we do have about half of our business is with industrial companies or half our business is with consumer packaged goods or half our business is appliances. That's the area that you kind of already specialize in. So that makes it really easy to select And by the way, I'm never going to say don't take the other business. If you say, hey, we specialize in consumer product goods, but we also have this weird thing where we do a whole bunch of flatbeds for these other guys. That's fine. Don't give that business up. Maybe that's your next area of specialization. But you have to pick a niche. And I think when I say pick a niche, by the way, I'm going to read this. This is from another an article I had written before with Kevin Hill. You might specialize in automotive. And even automotive, that could be inbound automotive to the manufacturing facilities, or it could be aftermarket parts, huge businesses. That'd be General Motors, Ford, Fiat, Nissan, Honda. There's a million of them. Well, I should say there's 10. But even Magna and TRW, Continental, those big tier ones, tier twos. Then there's chemical and plastic, huge space. Industrial and manufacturing, which could be Bosch or Hitachi, Boeing, huge spaces. Government defense. We know our government spends some money. They move a lot of stuff, especially the Department of Defense, General Service Administration, all, all the different. And there's even the local and state energy and petrochemicals, huge space. Consumer packaged goods, which is like Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, huge companies. Furniture, its own niche because you got to do certain things with that business. Food and beverage, as we said, huge. Appliances, electronics, health and pharma, pretty big these days and a retail and e-commerce. These are all segments you can specialize in, and there's probably 20 more. These are just, I think I probably stole these when I wrote this off of C.H. Robinson's website because they've done it right. They're a huge company, and they've said, we specialize in these different niches. And for every niche, they have people who they've assigned who become those, those experts in those spaces. But I think that's important to say that, though, because if you are going to specialize in a plethora of service offerings, then you're now saying to your audience, I'm going to set up a president or a managing partner or a managing director of that specific niche. Because what happens is a Joe and a me, I want to call and get that service and talk to someone who's just as crazy about their service offering as I am about marketing, as he is about the supply chain. So that's what you're going to need to have is that type of leadership focus in those specific segments. If you don't, that's when you start to get kind of convoluted and you sound like the people who say, oh, transparency is everything and then specialize here. But you can't be that way to everyone if you don't have the true specialist there. So be careful about it. The second thing I'll say to that, Joe, is you brought up another point. If 50 percent of your engagement is coming from a specific audience, that is your audience. Right. That's You're your that's your place. Other people. <laughs> But that is your audience. And when you want to say pick a niche, 
you pick that audience and you say, okay, great. 50% of my revenues come from these guys. How can I double down on that? Because they're already spending money with me. They're already putting their eyeballs on me. They're already coming to my website. So if, if they're there, then they have friends who like what they like and buddies in the industry that like what they like. How do I reach them? That's how I would turn a company around and, and bring in millions is talking to them. Not by saying, okay, forget the 50% that's loyal to us. Let's go out here and try to get people that we don't even know if they like us or not. That doesn't make sense. Right. And, you know, it's interesting. After you pick a niche, it's not just over. Don't just make this a website exercise. Once you've picked a niche, you got to become that niche. If I say I'm going to specialize in food, then that means I probably have some food customers then I want to start picking their brains. I want to go to lunch with them. I want to say, hey, JD, you work with us and you're a food guy. Why are you working with me? What made you pick us? What things should we be doing better? And, you know, a lot of times I can tell the, my own experience. I ask that guy on the dock, hey, why do you like us? Because you pick up my freight and you deliver it usually on time. That's not good enough. You got to get a little deeper than that. And sometimes you got to catch the right guy at the right time to have that conversation. But if you have some customers you're already working with and if they're serving, that's your niche, that's the place you want to develop, go deeper with them. Really understand what conferences do you go to? What magazines do you read? Where did you go to school? Tell me more. I want to understand everything about you. And more than anything, I want to understand the biggest problems that you face when it comes to my area. So now you're talking about something that I believe on this call your audience are supply chain driven, meaning they're process driven people. OK, process driven people typically don't like marketers because marketers cannot bring them a process, an algorithm or some guarantee that says that there's an absolute. OK, but what you just described is a part of marketing that most people don't know exists and a part of marketing that most companies are lacking and need to engage in. And that's market research. There is a, a fruitfulness that comes from having one of your, it could be a director, it could be a VP, it could be your marketing person. And if it is your marketing person, I would then say, send them with a process person, a Joe, because the Joe understands the process, the marketer understands how to talk to the person so they can get to the process. All right. So when we're doing this market research, that is how marketers listening and process people listening. This is how we learn to communicate with you. Because then I come back to with you with a target audience. This is your target it is a male between the ages of 30 and 45 years old. They're patriots. They're typically going to be Republicans. They are going to love anything red, white and blue. They're going to be gun carrying or let's say like NASCAR. <laughs> NASCAR or let's say it's going to be 18 to 25 and it's going to be a, a lady who likes to work out and she has typically children on the way. She's just being married. This whatever the, the data says. That market research marketers is what validates you in a room full of Joes. And Joes, if you're not getting what you're looking for out of your market team, then tell them I need you to go hire a market researcher or go find a company to hire to do market research for you so that they can come in and talk. And you got me excited right now, Joe, because that market research is what validates the presence of a marketing person in the C-suite office. Right. Right. Exactly. I, I 100% agree with what you're saying. And when you mentioned pairing a process person with this research person, so that I'll, I'll put in other words, same thing, though, is you got to do your research. You have to understand that space really well, the demographics. But also when I talk about the five biggest problems, I've done a lot of content marketing and so has uh, <laughs> JD. And the challenge you have when you're on the marketing side of that is you don't have input from that process guy, from that ops guy who lives the problem every day. And what you need to do, you know, they say the um, innovation lives between the boulders. So the one boulder is sales and mar is sales, and the other boulder is marketing, maybe ops. So those boulders, the innovation is where those guys connect. And so years ago, I had Craig Fuller on here from Freight Waves. And one of the things he said, I asked him, I go, how do you guys create such great content? Because they really do. I said, and he said, we pair great writers with great Ops guys, guys who understand this, logistics guys, guys who live this space. So that's really important piece to this is, again, once I've picked a niche, now I got to understand the customer really well. I got to understand their biggest problems. I want to get my ops guy involved. I want to get my sales guy involved. What are you hearing? And then when we finally decide, okay, I think we understand our target market. We understand their biggest problems. Now, every piece of content I write is going to be, to JD's point, 
aligned with what that guy wants to read. And so it's their biggest problems and your solutions and whatever else you can speak to. And that means you got to get to their conferences. Well, when they're worst conferences, <laughs> but the articles you write, the podcasts you do, the videos you do, the website, everything is aligned. And again, it's, you know what? You can't fake it either, JD. A lot of marketing people are, are left adrift. They don't get input from operations or sales and they write, I've done it myself, popcorn. They write a piece of popcorn because they, they don't know the customer well enough. Well, they may not know the, the jargon or they may not know the issue. Oh, yeah. And the issue with that comes is something I posted recently and it got some pretty good reviews is that, guys, stop sending salespeople who only know your product to conferences and trade shows without a Joe or a me or a Smee. Whoever that subject matter expert is, you got to send it there because it validates them. Like, it's a pair, guys. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got their own career track. But I talk to a lot of people who will say, well, I started in this business as an ops guy. And so I'm really not a sales guy. I'm like, you're the best sales guy. You actually know the problem. You live through this problem. That's the good part about this. As opposed to, and, and not to put it, I'm not ever going to put sales guys down, but sometimes sales guys don't come. They were selling something else. Now they're selling this. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just you got to fill in the gaps in your experience to understand customers. When we get to the point where, and we tested it at TTN, you should have cross-functional meetings when it comes to marketing. And specifically with your customer outreach team, any type of, I hate the company, I hate what you've done, or I hate what, what's not being solved by your product, that's when I can flip that in marketing and we can say, here's how we solve, or here's how we're able to meet that need. So when you get each department coming together and talking, that's when you get a good brand. But when you stick marketing off in a corner and you feel as though they shouldn't be a part of the meeting because it's an ops meeting, Here's the thing. You may be looking at it, and I've been in meetings, let's say TTN, my, my previous employer. They're sitting there talking about the increase of accidents on the road right now and how our wait time on the phones have actually decreased and how our outreaches as far as for calls and outbound calls going out have increased, meaning that although there's more wrecks outside, we have such good processes that we have not seen any change where we need to hire bodies or we're scrambling. We worked our processes and procedures. That's a marketing piece. Right. But right. I was meeting to hear that. They just thought it was just them rambling and going off. But to me, the marketer, I was like, bingo, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the stuff right there. So I want to summarize a little bit here, but I'm not done with you yet, JD. So if we talk about, we need to pick a niche. And again, that's usually not that hard because you, you're already working. You're already working with some area that you understand. You see, we seem, seem, seem to serve these guys best. And that's about half our business. That's your niche. So your first niche. So then you got to really commit. You have to understand. You got to do this research. You got to do the work to understand their problems and your solutions. That means, again, attending their conferences, reading the magazines they read, see where they went to school, see what they went to school for, everything you can do to get inside their head. And then you're going to start creating content. And the way, we, again, we just, J.D. hit on it, content can't be just from the marketer's head. It's got to be from ops head. It's got to be from sales head. It's got to be from the customers. And ideally, the articles you want to write are the out of his mouth. So he says, you know what I hate? Blank, blank, and blank, and whatever jargon he used, you go, that yes. becomes my marketing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it reminds me, years ago, somebody said to me, we were talking about consulting with transportation and logistics. And they said, there was a business owner that said, I don't know if I run this business or it runs me. And we're like, oh, that's it. That's it. Because a lot of business owners, as soon as we said that, go, oh yeah, that's me. This business owns me. I don't own this. It owns me. And so we started using that language. So again, we're trying to get to the point where we can create really good content because what we all know now is when we're going to buy a new car or we're going to buy a new house, we're going to send our kid to college, go on a trip to California to see wine country, we all start with an internet search. And JD, he's a great marketer, he can't help you if you say, I want to be found everything to everyone. You have to be able to write the article that when Google says this is the right article for this guy. So if I'm looking for a house near me, 
the guys who might get my business could be the realtor who, who has the best information for me. It could be the realtor who wrote an article about buying a house in this crazy 2021 20, environment. You have to be the guy who wrote the content that was already inside their head. You got to write that stuff that it just resonates. And again, this is 90 some percent of B2B buyers start with an internet search and it could start years before, years before they could say, I'm not wild about my 3PL. I'm not wild about my broker contracts coming up at the end of the year. I'm going to start Googling around. I'm going to start looking on LinkedIn and they're looking. And then at some point they go, I like this content and they start following you. And before you know it, they like you, you're connected to them. They come to your webinar, they listen to your podcast. And then when it's time to buy, they already know you and they might already be two thirds of the way buying from you and they haven't talked to you yet. And that's the cool thing if you do it right. If you do it right. That's exactly what I was going to say. If you do do it right, they should know your name before they buy. But also we have to look at that now. This goes into tying in a current event. When Apple is saying, do you want this app to track you? Here's what's actually happening behind all that. It isn't just so much like tracking your location. It's tracking how much time you spend on other applications. It's tracking what you are searching. It's tracking when you search them. And this is over an amount of years. So there's actually softwares and tools out there where I can now say every year around May, Joe seems to buy X for his mom. He spends about $300 last Four years ago, it was $900 for some reason. And then they compare that to, oh, it was a big birthday for her. It was her 75th year. And so he did, you know, nine. So, but then I can now say every May, he's spending about 500 bucks. Okay, great. So I need 5,000 Joes that spend about 500 bucks each for Mother's Day for their, for their mothers. We know that they have that in their budget. They do it yearly. How do I market to them starting right after Christmas? Did you hear the, the time frame right after Christmas so that they can start thinking about their mom? And that's just once a month, just dropping in on this or that. And, and eventually I have a makeup or a profile of Joe and I know to the scary T almost how right. his cash flow goes, where his cash balances are, when he's going, where the ebbs and flows and how I can get right. access to every penny extra that he's not spending. That is the scary part of like the current event right now. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And so so you have to know those customers. And again, I'm going to s- summarize this again. Is we'll pick, we got to pick a niche, then we got to commit to it. We really have to understand it real well. Then we got to create content that really resonates with them. That's what we're looking to do. It has to resonate in a way that they go, oh, these guys get it. They just described the five biggest problems with moving food, or they just described the five biggest problems in the post-pandemic or in the, in the COVID era, how to move freight. And they go, oh, this is the guy. And I'll tell you this perfect example. I want to do this topic, everything to everyone. And it's just kind of been on the back of my mind. And I'm scrolling through LinkedIn. I go, oh, it's JD. It's JD. I never talked to him until we did this podcast, but I read his stuff probably for a year. I, I kept seeing him. He kept popping up. He'd have an article. He's on a web, webinar. And I was like, oh, okay. This is the guy's always on podcast. This guy understands it. I see his article. I know already he's the right guy. Then we talk on the phone a few times and here we are. So anyway, JD, summarize this big old topic for us. <laughs> <laughs> I think the big summary of it is, is just not being afraid to specialize. I don't think you are losing out on any market share. If anything, I could probably grab two or three of my data guys and we can show you that you're actually increasing your market share when you go into a niche and you become an expert because you have expounding marginal profit that continues to grow as you continue to show your expertise. So I would say the summary of that is just don't be afraid to specialize, guys. It's okay. Right. And, you know, if I could say something also, J.D., this also applies to individuals. So if you're working somewhere think about that because you're probably not going to retire from wherever you're working. You're not going to retire from there. So decide where you want to be an expert. And that might, again, it's going to a little bit decide on where you came from. So if you're a logistics guy and you said, you know, I spent my whole career working at my mom and dad's restaurant. I understand food service really well. And at some point you're working at a company that moves that you say, Hey, that's it. I'm a food guy. Or I always, uh, I always worked at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever. And I always liked that. I met the, every weekend I met those stores. Maybe that's your specialization, big box. But you have to pick something. 
if for your career, because again, your, your employer doesn't particularly care about how you are developed that way. If your employer could get you in a area that doesn't matter, or they could say you're everything to everyone. So you as a company need to pick a niche and you as an individual need to. Well, your, your value goes up when you pick a niche as an individual. So a lot of people don't recognize it, but because for some reason we go into our professional settings, we lose everything about who we are personally. So here's what I mean by that, Joe. All of us value and consume content from people that we deem to be experts in their fields and in their crafts. And we like to hear someone who is truly obsessed with what they do, someone that shows their passion and we hear, oh, be authentic. And we love to see it because we can feel it. So if you like feeling it, why don't you give your audience the opportunity to feel your own expertise in your niche? And what begins to happen is you talk enough, you show that you're a thought leader, you go through that bell curve of people, of early adopters and people not really liking you and not really knowing you. And then eventually the Joes of the world, I've had some other people call. I've been doing this marketing thing for six years, but to some people it can sound like I'm an overnight success because you're just now starting to see you know, me more congru- concurrently in different avenues. And it's actually just been a slow build-up process of me showing that I'm an industry leader. Same thing with Joe. You're at, what, almost 700 episodes, and you know. Yeah. It's interesting because before I did the podcast, I wrote probably a 1,000 articles for myself and others. And and so it's funny when somebody says, I would like a following like that. I was like, that's cool. Do like 100, 100 podcasts a year, dozens of webinars over the 10 years, and write a 1,000 articles, and you get that same following. But anyway. <laughs> no, you're right. I think you're right, man. You specialize in something you went head on. And it wasn't pretty in the beginning. And I think sometimes people see where you are now and they're like, I want that. But they don't remember. That's why I always say is if you want to start, you know, picking your niche, you could right now, anybody can do this. You could create, you might say, I don't want to do a podcast on a regular basis. Do five or six episodes of something. Do five webinars on a topic. Write five articles. If you wrote one article every other month, So that's six a year, right? And over two or three years, I've got 18 articles, right? And if it's all in a topic and somebody says, yeah, this guy knows this like the back of his hand. We all went to school. We all had to write reports. And then when we get out of school and somebody says, I'm not really much of a writer. Now I say, yeah, yeah, you have a master's degree. How'd that happen? (laughs) It's important though, man. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up because I believe that specialization is not just for corporations. It's for you as an individual as well. And I believe that there's someone listening to Joe and I right now who is having those thoughts in your head, in your bathroom, in the tub, in the shower, on the drive, that's saying you're not good enough, that's saying that you can't do it, that's saying that other people are already doing it. I didn't ask you any of those questions and your audience that's waiting for you to talk didn't ask you any of those questions. So start sharing what you love, find the audience that will love you back, And then I promise you, man, you're going to see things slowly but surely just turn into opportunities that could potentially yield you earnings for your life. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Great stuff, J.D. So before we wrap this bad boy up, tell us a little bit what's going on over at AXA. First off, who do you serve and what do you guys do and how do we reach out and all that good stuff? Yeah. So AXA, we're a marketing firm. You can reach us at AXA.com or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn We are a little bit quiet. We are a little bit private because we do choose who we work with. So you may reach out and I may say, hey, Jay, you want to work with you? And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. But, you know, we're not either ready for that yet or we're specifically focusing on which right now we are logistics companies that are trying to 10x, which means we have a, a deeper labyrinth of growth. And then we're also focusing on startups who are trying to mature quickly in their target audience development. So we're doing that. And as well as on the personal side, we have a new venture that we're going into called MyFair, P-H-A-R-E. And MyFair is the DEI calculator that allows you to filter out whatever you're looking for in a potential prospect or a candidate for your company for a role. You're going to be able to find that. So if you're looking for a Joe who has 20 years of experience in logistics, as well as 20 years of experience specifically in automotive with degree, and you know they let's say they have seven years of P and L experience with 20 million or more, 
These are the things that we're bringing to the audience. So I'm using our firm to put this out there to let everyone know that we're here. We're slowly starting to talk to investors. We're getting great interest. So I do believe this next venture is going to be the one where we can say it took off. Excellent. Excellent. So what I'll do, JD, is I'll put a link to those things, including your LinkedIn profile in the show notes and, uh, I do appreciate you taking the time, and uh, you're a great guest to have on my podcast. Thank you. I've enjoyed myself. Thank you, and thank you for listening to the podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com.